and it lies across me, warm and heavy, and I feel its fur in my mouth. Hi and welcome back to Terry Talks Movies and I am doing some hammer horror this time around. By the way, if you're wondering, these things are skulls. I've been requested to do these three movies so I, I watched them and I enjoyed them more or less and I'm going to review them. So let's get started. I'm going to do these in reverse order. They're called the Karnstein Trilogy and they're based on an 1872 novel by uh, uh, Joseph Sheridan Lefanu called Carmilla which is about a lesbian vampire, and for 1872, that's a big, big, forward-looking piece of work. And I want to do them in reverse order, the newest one first, and then the other two, because I think we need to end on the high note. And the other thing I'm going to do, which is totally unrelated to the movies, is tell you a story about what happened when I was working in Canberra, our nation's capital, once upon a time and I scared a whole bunch of politicians. So stick around for that. In the 1970s were a tough decade for Hammer Films. They ended up making their last movie in 1976, To the Devil a Daughter, uh, until their reboots at various times since then. But the Hammer that we know from the classic movies finished up with that. So Hammer was going through a few rough times in the 70s, in the late 60s, they didn't really adapt to the changes in the B-movie exploitation movie market, which was largely driven by small cinemas and the drive-in movie theatres in America. And so their business partners in America, American International Pictures, started to encourage them to make some more adult content. Not in the sense of blood and guts, but in the sense of female nudity. Busty substances. <laughs> so Hammer made the Karnstein trilogy, which leaned into that aesthetic more than any other films that Hammer really did. So we'll start with the third one, which is directed by John Hoff, a director who had a long career. He made Biggles in 1986. He made Return to Witch Mountain in 1978, which people remember fondly. Uh, Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, he directed that as well, but he also directed Twins of Evil. I don't have a physical copy of Twins of Evil, which I should remedy for the Hammer Film Collection. But uh, the movie's got a fairly good cast in parts, and a fairly ordinary cast in other parts. It stars Peter Cushing as Gustav Weil, a religious man in Styria in the 1700s, who has a really repugnant side hustle in that he is a witch hunter. He finds women who he thinks are witches and burns them at the stake along with a whole bunch of other people who are there to carry the pitchforks and the torches. Not a nice man. Interesting thing is his wife's played by an actress who had a great career in British cinema, Kathleen Byron. You might remember her as the nun who goes mad in Powell and Pressburger's Black Narcissus. If you haven't seen that movie, you should really check it out as well. But in the 1970s, she was doing lesser roles, even though she was an incredibly good actress. And she gets to play the kind of wife to a mad bastard, really, <laughs> played by Peter Cushing. And he does a really nice job of it. He had that kind of aesthetic look about him, that gauntness really played well into the character. Gustav and, and Katie have nieces called Maria and Frida, played by Mary and Madeline Collinson who were best known previous to this movie for doing a Playboy magazine centerfold together in the 1970s. The supporting cast got a few people you might know in it as well. David Warbeck, who made a few movies in Italy as well. Um, Harvey Hall, who turned up in a whole bunch of Hammer films and became a very familiar face in the 1970s in Hammer. And Dennis Price, a really fine actor who unfortunately had a few problems. He had some tax problems. He had some problems with alcohol. But getting back to the movie, one of the twins is a bit naughty. Frida is fascinated with Count Karnstein, who has a reputation for being a wicked man. He has the year of the emperor. He's got a lot of clout. And he is also a vampire. And he turns Frida into a vampire, while her good sister Maria stays pure and nice. Maria takes a liking to a local school teacher, a guy called Anton, played by David Warbeck, and they kind of have 
the start of a, a much less bloody relationship, let's say. So Frida attacks somebody and she's caught by her uncle and put into a prison cell. And the Count arranges for Frida to be replaced by Maria. And therefore Maria is for the chop. She's going to be burnt at the stake because everybody thinks that she's her twin sister. Doesn't turn out like that. Everything turns out okay in the end. Peter Cushing's character gets his comeuppance and the movie folds into the usual kind of hammer ending. For me, it's the least of the three Karnstein movies because even though it does have Peter Cushing, even though it does have Kathleen Byron and Dennis Price and, and other interesting actors in it, I don't think it leans into the general concept that the original novel Carmilla has. It's a kind of lesser sequel in the same way that all of those Planet of the Apes movies had diminishing returns in the 1970s. Didn't really do it for me, but it does have a couple of things that I, I like. It has a nice scene at the end where the Count disintegrates into a corrupt corpse. I always liked those kind of time-lapse dissolve things that Hammer did whenever a vampire was staked and they ended up being a kind of crumbly skeleton at the end of the movie. I, I like that a lot. But for the most part, this one really didn't do it for me, which is a bit of a shame. Um, it probably would have done it for me at the time I watched it originally because it does have a soupçon of nudity in it, less than the other two. It just didn't feel like they were going hammer and tongs in the usual over-the-top hammer way. That brings us to A Lust for a Vampire, which was directed by Jimmy Sangster, who had a long career doing Hammer films. He was actually replacing Terence Fisher at very short notice, but uh, I like what he did with this movie, even though the whole concept of Lust for a Vampire is batshit crazy. According to Wikipedia, the British Board of Film Classification clamped down a bit on Hammer doing overtly lesbian scenes in their vampire movies. So both Twins of Evil and Lust for a Vampire have less sapphic content than the first one did. Now I'm going to talk about that one last because I like the first movie, The Vampire Lovers, a lot more than I like the other two. And the weird thing is that it weakens the film. Now the vampire in this case is played by Jura Stensgaard, who maybe isn't the best actress in the world, but she's kind of lusted after by two men. In this one, she's pretending to be a student in a girls' school, and she's lusted after by two men. The first one is a school teacher called Giles Barton, played by Ralph Bates. They were grooming Ralph Bates to be the next Peter Cushing. Didn't happen um, because he, he just didn't have the wonderfulness of Peter Cushing. Let's be honest about it. And the other person lusting after these young girls is a guy called Richard Lestrange, played by Michael Johnson, who's a kind of charming, suave writer of, of some repute, who is traveling around and wants to get some stories about the Karnstein family. This one's set 40 years after Vampire Lovers. And so he decides to become a teacher at the school teaching literature to all of these young girls, most of whom are in their 20s, of course, because they're actresses and models and some of them were actresses in adult movies so you know there, there was a little bit of friskiness and nudity in the particularly when it was bedtime in this school you do get a little bit of female nudity in that part of it you get mike raven who was a dj playing count karnstein and his voice is dubbed by valentine dahl because apparently mike raven's voice wasn't suited to being a vampire overlord and Valentine Dial would have been my go-to for voicing a vampire overlord at the time. He had a deep, resonant voice that really worked well. Oh, Lord of Darkness, Prince of Hell, hear this, thy servant's plea. He was also in City of the Dead, the movie from, I think, 1960 that also had Christopher Lee in it. There is a little bit of lesbianism in the movie. There's a, a, one of the students... Uh, called Susan, played by Pippa Steele, who was also one of the victims in The Vampire Lovers, has a kind of liaison 
with the vampire Carmilla. I'm going to call her Carmilla because it's Carmilla, Michaela, Car Marcilla. They do the anagram thing, which is part of the original story. So she kind of gets sucked dry by Carmilla and dumped down a well, which is um, not particularly a nice thing to do to people. And it kind of follows on with something I'm going to talk about when I talk about vampire lovers, which is the relationships that the vampire has with her victims. Now, like the vampire lovers, this one's got a script by Tudor Gates, which is the best name for somebody to do scripts for Hammer horror films. Now, it does a few things I don't like, particularly. Carmilla falls in love with Richard Lestrange, the, the writer. And there's a bit of that 1970s thing about lesbians where if the right guy comes along, they'll turn straight. I mean, they did it in Goldfinger with Pussy Galore um, in the novel and, and in the movie in a, in a more subtle way. So there was this kind of idea that a good, studly, lusty man would turn lesbians straight. And as reality has taught us many, many times over the last 50 years, that's bullshit. And the, the kind of relationship between Lestrange and Carmilla is hilarious. For a start, Yuta Stensgaard um, crosses her eyes when she's kind of in the raptures of romance, let's say. And that is hilariously funny. Plus, there's a really bad song done in the montage of them making love called Strange Love. And it is probably the worst piece of music from the 1970s, apart from ABBA. It's, uh, it's hilariously bad, and you can enjoy it in an unironic what-the-hell kind of way. We also get Harvey Hall again playing a police inspector who investigates the missing girl, Susan. And uh, Harvey Hall gets taken care of in a very interesting way, which is nicely suspenseful as well. There are a couple of moments of suspense in this film, but I would have liked to have seen more of them. It's kind of self-conscious, and possibly that's the feedback they got from the censorship people, that they had to be a little bit careful and a little bit diffident about certain kinds of content in this movie. But for me, it, it's a little bit shy and a little bit too careful to be a good exploitation movie in the in the classic sense because good genre exploitation movies go balls to the wall they just do what they do and let the censorship sort itself out afterwards didn't happen this way with lust for a vampire i've actually got the dvd version of it. i haven't got a um blu-ray yet i really should look into that at some stage but there's the Australian DVD version of Lust for a Vampire, which has no extras in it, but it's a pretty good transcription of it. And this one's so old, it's got um, the Macrovision copy protection logo on the back. Down there. Which shows you how long ago this one was put out. I'm really going to have to try to find a, a Blu-ray copy of both it and Twins of Evil at some stage, because, yeah, I'm kind of diving deeper into Hammer and I want to have the best possible versions of it with extras if possible. So that then brings us to the best of the three. The Vampire Lovers, directed by Roy Ward Baker. It's got a good cast in it as well. We've got Peter Cushing, George Cole, Kate O'Mara, Madeline Smith, Dawn Adams, John Finch and the wonderful Ingrid Pitt. We get a nice little pre-title sequence in this one to set up the mythology of the Karnstein trilogy, where Baron Hartog, played by Douglas Wilmer, basically is hunting down a vampire who is killing young women in the local area. He finds a vampire and finds that she's a beautiful woman in a very diaphanous gown, and ultimately he kills her, and then we cut to a few decades later in 1790, and a party held by General Spielsdorf, played by Peter Cushing, who is holding a party for his niece, Laura, who has just come of age. And so it's a kind of coming out ball. There's lots of people dancing around. She's enamored of a young man in the local district, played by John Finch. Now, a baroness turns up at the party, played by Dawn Adams, who has brought along her niece, Carmilla, played by 
Ingrid Pitt. The Baroness kind of fakes General Spielsdorf out by faking uh, a dying relative and she has to travel to visit the dying relative and leaves her niece behind because her niece and Laura have bonded. As time moves on, Laura weakens and, and starts dying because, of course, she's being seduced and sucked dry by Carmilla. There seems to be a genuine fondness between Carmilla and the young woman. She really is genuinely fond of her. And, of course, there is the lustful lesbian aspect of that as well, which was a real problem for the censors. John Trevelyan, the main censor, had big concerns about the lesbian aspects of the vampire lovers because he'd had trouble with the killing of sister George in the previous year and so he was really concerned and he wrote to Hammer expressing those concerns that they were planning to make a version of Carmilla, the original story. And Hammer quite wisely wrote back to John Trevelyan and said, the lesbianism is innate in the story, it's in the original source material and we're going to progress with it anyway because it is intrinsic to the story. And Trevelyan went, okay, so the chief censor of the UK got the nod for this one, even though the censors who followed him when the other two movies were being made were a lot more hands-on against that lesbian aspect in the Karnstein trilogy. And the Baroness tries the trick again with a guy called Mr. Morton, played by George Cole, who has a young niece, Emma, played by Madeline Smith. Now, George Cole's an interesting actor. I remember him first playing Flash Harry, the local bookmaker in the Centrinians comedies in the early in the late 50s and early 1960s. And I liked him in that. In the 1970s, he was very successful in a TV series called Minder with Dennis Waterman, where he played a dodgy salesman and businessman called Arthur Daly. But this is in between those two. And his Mr. Morton, is kind of a, a slightly sleazy character. His daughter has a governess, played by Kate O'Mara, called Madame Peridot. And there's a little bit of an implication that Madame Peridot is having a relationship with Mr. Morton. So Camilla the Vampire goes and, and stays with Emma. The governess st starts getting a little suspicious of the relationship between the two young ladies. And Camilla instantly seduces her and this isn't the vampiric kind of seduction this is like two women recognizing their mutual attraction and um getting together it's done in a, a very different way than the relationship with the young girls in the movie and i kind of like that carmilla is kind of seductive to madame it's, it seems to be a, a very equal relationship up until the point she basically enslaves the woman so that she can spend more time with the young girl, Emma. And the relationship between Emma and Carmilla is really interesting in this one. And Ingrid Pitt is fantastic in this. Because ultimately, Carmilla in The Vampire Lovers is a tragic figure. She genuinely falls in love with these women that she's sucking dry. And the tragedy is that she falls in love with these young women. And because of her nature, she drains them until they die. And so she can never find happiness. And I like that aspect of it. It's played quite well by Ingrid Pitt, who was... I think a better actress than she was ever given credit for and ever given roles for. She was very good in the movie she did after this, Countess Dracula, which was for Hammer as well. They offered her Lust for a Vampire, which she knocked back and then she took up Countess Dracula, which gave her a more nuanced role. And that one's an interesting film too. It's got interesting actors in it like Nigel Green. The really interesting part of this is that the men are very much secondary characters in this story. The focus is for the most part in this movie, on the female characters, which is not something that Hammer did a lot, and it's not something that horror cinema did a lot as well. It's a really nuanced horror movie, which isn't particularly pejorative to same-sex attraction among women. And I like that. I think it play, makes the movie play really well to a modern audience, except incels. Uh, yeah, and, and at the time I first saw Vampire Lovers, I saw it very much differently than I see it now. For me, it was all about the nudity and, and the kind of sauciness of it. Seeing it in a more mature age has given me an appreciation of the movie that's different, but no less strong. I, I like the fact that we've got a vampire who is nuanced 
and not just kind of there to prey on people you know not is not just an ambush predator in that sense and Camilla is played by Ingrid Pitt gives us a character that you can understand why people are seduced by her and you can also understand why she ultimately is a tragic figure. You know, this isn't the first adaptation of Le Fanu's story. Carl Dreyer's movie Vampire is an adaptation of Carmilla, but they took out all the lesbian sexuality. Uh, you got a little bit of it in Dracula's Daughter in 1936 as well, which is a really interesting film and want to revisit at some stage. Roger Vadim did a version of it as Blood and Roses in 1960. And in 1972, there was another adaptation of it as well, The Blood Splattered Bride which starred Alexandra Bastido, which was done, I think, uh, in Spain. So it's, it's a story that's going to be told often, um, in the same way that Dracula is told often. It's in the public domain for a start, so anybody can tell the story. If we're looking for the most impactful version of the story, it's definitely got to be The Vampire Lovers. I think it, it stays true to the plot of the original, though the ending is a little more prosaic than the ending of the story, which I'm not going to spoil, read the story. It's become one of the best vampire movies that Hammer ever did. But for me, the first one is definitely the best. But re-watching the three, I enjoyed the experience. I watched them sequentially from Vampire Lovers to Lust for a Vampire to Twins of Evil. In a modern age, it would have been done very differently. I think there would have been more closeness to the continuity between the three. But this is 1970s and... That wasn't particularly a concern for a studio that was trying to save itself from drowning. But anyway, I'm going to tell you that story now about how I scared a bunch of politicians in Canberra. It was the 1980s and I'd moved to Canberra fairly recently. I got a job with the Australian Capital Territory Department of Sport, Recreation and Racing. We were organising events for you know, to keep kids active and sporting events and, and public events in the nation's capital. And part of my job was to be a mascot for a program called Life Be In It, which was a national program to encourage people to eat well, to exercise and to wear sunscreen in the summertime, all sorts of things like that. And the mascot was a character called Norm, who was a slob. He's a big slob and he there were ongoing cartoon advertisements done with Norm, where Norm would be encouraged to be healthier and to kind of change his life and to, and to be a much better person. So they had this costume and it had an enormous paper mache head, had big floppy feet at various public events. I got to be Norm in this mascot costume. So Life Beyond It was running a fun run for charity and they were encouraging people to be part of the fun run. And to do that, they did a promotional event the day before the fun run was supposed to start where they got a whole bunch of ACT and national politicians around. There were three or four of them. It was a really cold winter morning and they're all wearing hoodies that we provided with the logos on them for the fun run and for life be in it. And they're standing around and they were going to watch Norm shoot the starting pistol and then a bunch of people were going to start a fun run so they could catch a bit of it for the cameras and for the press photographers. So we're there and, you know, the politicians are drinking coffee and I can't drink coffee because I've got this enormous paper mache head on and I can't see very well out of it. And so somebody hands me the starting pistol and tells me what I've got to do. And I go, OK, yeah, let's do it. And it's about three minutes before we're about to start. And they're getting all the cameras lined up and everything. And nobody told me that this starting pistol had a hair trigger. And I mean, a really hair trigger. Touch the trigger. It would go off. And so all these politicians are standing around in white hoodies with cups of coffee there. And I touch the trigger and the pistol goes off really loudly. And all the politicians go, ah, and pour coffee all over themselves. And these are white hoodies, so they're all coffee stained. We had to find new hoodies for them. It was a mess. The politicians thought it was an assassination attempt. And all sorts of, you know, everybody was shit scared and, and terrified until they realized what happened. And they took the pistol away from me until right at the very last moment where I could do the thing. And I got in trouble for it. And um, we're talking about quite high politicians. The leader of the Senate the upper house of our federal parliament. Senator Margaret Reed was there and she poured coffee on herself. A couple of Labour politicians are... Yeah, it's uh, it was an interesting time in my life. And so nobody should ever hand me a starting pistol again. It's the wrong thing to do and it's going to end in chaos. So that's the story. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and leave a comment. You can also support the channel by donating a little bit each month at patreon.com slash paleocinema. Got a few more video ideas that I'm going to be doing, a few more videos. 
maybe check out the Halloween horror playlist I've got on the channel as well. There's a whole bunch of movies I've reviewed in that that you might enjoy. So on that note, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, watch some Hammer horror films, and be careful of starting pistols. And I'll catch you next time. Thank you.